Hello and welcome to this review of the Plank Keyboard, part of this series of miniature and space-saving keyboards. I borrowed this one off of someone because people keep asking me to review one of these. I just don't understand what you guys like so much about small keyboards. Now, I'm definitely the best person to judge one of these because I hate small keyboards, I have difficulties with ergonomic layout, and I can't touch type, so obviously this should be right up my alley, no? So prepare for a lot of swearing. I know a lot of you really like to see me suffer, and if you're one of them, you might want to grab a beer and fire up the popcorn, because there will be a lot of suffering in this video. Ah, the suffering. The sweet suffering. Anyway, let's start with the basics. It uses what's known as a 40% form factor, which is an extremely small form in which the numpad, nav cluster, F key row, and even a number row have all been chopped off, so it's really tiny. By the way, although it's called a 40%, it uses 48 keys. Basically, to access anything but a letter or modifier, you need to use one of two different layers, of which the keys are here, I think. I'm still not really sure how this is a good thing, but hey, I mean, two layers, what the fucking fuck? To make matters worse, it uses an ortholinear layout, which means that the keys aren't staggered, like they are on normal keyboards, but they're all in a grid, so the positions of all the keys are different. Again, I have no clue what the benefit of this could possibly be other than to be able to make waffles with it more easily. And to top it all off just to annoy you, they stuck keycaps on it with no legends on them, which means you barely even get the opportunity to learn the layout at all. It's like the keyboard is teasing you, or a cruel prank you'd play on your friends, you know, as if someone gave you some IKEA furniture for free, but they deliberately left out the instruction manual on half the parts required to assemble it. Even the profile's the same, so they don't give away what rows the caps are on. If this thing had been wireless, I honestly wouldn't even have known what side of the keyboard is the front and which is the back. What does this one do? Oh, it's Q. What does this one do? Oh, it's Shift. What does this one do? Oh, it's Enter. And so forth, and so on, etc. You can program different layouts into it. In fact, the owner normally uses it with Dvorak, which would have made this thing even more impossible to use. But, at a suggestion, and doubtlessly for the better, he reprogrammed it with the default layout for me. Still, even default is kinda, well, fucking weird as shit are the words that come to mind, actually. I mean, you've got tab here in the top corner, and then escape somehow below it. Here in the corner below is a backlight button or something like that, although I think it's actually also shift. And then control next to it. Here is backspace, there's no delete button. This is backslash, and below that is a single unit enter key. And these two, I think... I think these two are two single unit spacebar keys. Yes, they actually went there. What the fuck in a glass of milk on a paper plate in a snowstorm were they thinking? Unlike even most 60% keyboards, it actually does have arrow keys, but they're in a line. They're these four keys here. It's quite interesting they went with this because a line nav is actually a really antiquated arrangement and even then keyboards with it, like this Apple M0116, are pretty uncommon. They didn't like it back in those days either. And no, I still don't even now. It's fucking horrible. They might as well not even be there. Typing on this is a fucking nightmare. Don't forget to check out the typing demo at the end to see my extremely futile attempts at writing a few short sentences on it. Keep in mind that all the typing demos that I do are roughly equally long text-wise, and that they normally take between 20 and 30 seconds for me to type. Anyway, there's only one question left now, of course. I might be too stupid to type on it, but can I at least game on it? So, way before I did the rest of this review, even before I did the script on this or really got to grips with the layout, I recorded some game footage of me and Carl playing some video games together. I'm going to release a video on that tomorrow morning, so keep your eyes open for that one. Spoiler alert, everything was a complete disaster. Anyway, back to the board, in terms of build quality, it's actually pretty damn good. There's a lot of metal and high-density materials in it, so it weighs a relatively hefty 600 grams, and it feels exceptionally tight and well-held, it's like a brick. <laughs> Maybe that was what they were going with when they were styling it, actually. 
One note though, the case only has a bottom part, so the switches stick out all the way and they're not protected by the case at all. This type of floating switch design is a fashion trend for modern keyboards, apparently people like that, but I should point out that it does make the keyboard a bit vulnerable. See, with old keyboards that use a wraparound case like this, there's a huge crumple zone in the way of the switches that gives some serious protection, even if it's just plastic, but keyboards like the plank don't have that, so keep that in mind. The keyboard has no extendable feet, just these little stick-on plastic dots in the corners here, but it's got a fairly thick braided detachable USB cable. Now, I know that for many mechanical keyboards nowadays, braided cables are the norm, but still, these are quite nice, so I'm sure they can take a fair bit of punishment. There's even a beeper in there that makes a little sound when you plug in the keyboard. But technically speaking, it's capable of playing back a tune if you program it in, and there's even a piano mode you can engage by pressing both layer keys and the C key like this. <laughs> Sounds like fucking Space Invaders or Galaga, I love it. <laughs> And finally, there's the switches, which are called Zelios. I don't think I've had as many requests to review a single switch as these, except perhaps Topra, so I'm going to take my time delving into these into a little bit more detail. Note that these didn't come with the keyboard by default, that was done by the keyboard's owner. In fact, he originally had 180 gram springs in it, but thankfully he swapped them over for me. Zelios are tactile switches, custom manufactured by Gatoron, known for producing their own line of Cherry Amex clone switches, for Zeal PC. They found a fairly considerable audience with the mechanical keyboard community as a more upmarket alternative to existing switches, and most people that use Zelios tend to be really positive about them. I'd say there are three things that are key to these switches, and the guy behind them, Henry Liu, definitely knows what he's on about because they directly attack the three main issues I had with cherry switches, namely smoothness, tactility, and weighting. So one of the ways they tackle this is by using a custom mold for the stems. These special stems are exceptionally smooth, as you can see from the texture on the tactile leg and the rest of the slider, compared to that of a Cherry Amex Brown switch. Similarly, the switch housing has been made using a custom mold and a very high grade translucent plastic. It's all nylon and no fiberglass, which helps prevent friction with the slider and makes the key action smoother. But in order to attain this, they had to leave out the heat stabilizers that are commonly added to the plastics. As a result, these switches are not amenable to wave soldering techniques used in mass production assemblies, which I guess is ultimately one of the reasons why you won't find pre-made keyboards that come with these switches, so you can only buy them loose. This transparent housing is also more accommodating to backlighting, although you can get the standard milky bottom Gatoron housing as well, which is more heat resistant. Second, going back to the macro shot again, you can see that they've increased the tactility by making the notch in the slider bigger. It's this notch that disrupts key travel and provides the tactile feedback, and because of the bigger notch, Zelios have increased tactility, about 25 grams of force per millimeter. Compare that to Cherry MX Brown, and you can see the difference easily, the tactile bump is much bigger. Both the notch and the bump are basically the same size as that of MX Clears, which are almost as tactile at about 21 to 22 grams per millimeter, but because of the weighting, the bump is more apparent on the Zelios. And speaking of the weighting, that's the third thing they improved. Now, many cherry switches come in two flavors, light as shit and heavy as fuck. Take, for example, red, which is so light that you can actuate them by just the weight of your finger, and black, which is stiff enough that typing on them for a while really tires out your fingers, or at least it does so for me. The same thing goes with MX Brown and Clear, and MX Blue and Green. There's really no intermediate weighting available on any of these. Zelios can come in several weightings, but the most common is 65 or 67 grams of force. Now, you might think that's the same as MX Clears, but unlike those, this is a bottom-out weighting, not an actuation one. So the weighting is actually between the two, and I find it much more appealing that way. I've been told that the weighting was specifically chosen to bring out the tactile feel as much as possible. 
The springs are also gold-plated to prevent corrosion and thereby conserve smoothness, but truth be told I'm really not sure how much of a difference that really makes. I've seen relatively few rusted springs, even among the oldest boards in my collection. But who knows, maybe in 40 years or so I can comment on that one in more detail. <laughs> So, in terms of overall performance, the Zelios are definitely an improvement on other market options. They're exceptionally smooth and pretty nicely weighted. The tactility is better than that of most other MX type switches, but, and I know I've mentioned this several times now, the type of tactility is still not really to my liking. See, as the force curve shows, although the drop is fairly large, it's not very sharp, taking up a whole millimetre, and really, at heart, it's still just a disrupted linear switch. Also, despite definitely sounding better than stock switches, it also still has that dry, powdery typing noise you'd associate with linear and tactile cherry switches, which sounds rather flat. Here, listen to this. So, overall, because of both these issues, I still prefer Zelio Stottles, which have a sharper tactility, and the noise is better, at least if you stick some high-profile double-shot keycaps on them. Of course, I know the whole point of a tactile-only switch is that it's not supposed to make too much noise, but that's just the way I feel about it. Concluding the bit about the Zelios, I'd therefore say that they're a big improvement on other existing market options, and in my opinion definitely the best tactile MX type switch out there, but not THE best MX type switch overall. As for the rest of the board, fuck it. I'm sure it's great if you know how to type properly, but for people who just type normally like me, it's a fucking nightmare. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard. Next week there will be another Redux review, as usual, and after that I'll be seeing you again with a keyboard that's, yes, even smaller.